now we come to wind tunnel testing. Wind tunnel testing is an important part of aerodynamics. In spite of the advances in computational flow dynamics over the last 50 years or so, it is the rare, I don't think they even exist, the, the, it is the manufacture of flying things, which would include not just airplanes, but missiles, and while they're in the atmosphere, spacecraft, would not May, would not design these, improve these, and fly them, put people in them and fly them without some type of wind tunnel testing. So let's begin. We know that if we um, have a object in what we call a free flow, in other words, a flow like you have in the air, say for example, uh, Ball, golf ball which has been teed off it flies through the air even if the air is perfectly still it's been given velocity through the drive or impact or whatever and it is actually producing uh, it is going through the air and there's relative velocity between the ball or whatever object in the air and we can actually also see this not just in flying objects but also in things like buildings which have uh, winds pushed winds which go against them. And Newton, who just about invented everything, said that the drag force of this particular uh, uh, would be governed by the equation, some constant, some cross-sectional area, and that's always a source of confusion, times the density of the air, whatever fluid, it can also be water as well for underwater objects, times the velocity squared. He posited that that was the case. The problem was, we can find A pretty easily from the geometry, although just let, let's just be clear about one thing. The area that we pick for different types of objects is very much a subject of convention. It doesn't necessarily have to be, well, this is the way it is, and you, you know, and, and that's it. Uh, it is very much a matter of convention. And we'll talk about those conventions when we, particularly when we get in the lab. Okay. If I have um, a, you know, with, with this, the row, we can pretty much determine that. You, we can pretty much determine that. If I could determine C, I could determine the drag force. Now, you will recall, I hate that phrase. You know, I used to have professors that tell me that, and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't recall. Well, in, in, in case you missed it, let me just put it that way. In case you missed it, the um, uh, Bernoulli's equation, where we talked about flow in a streamline from point A to point B or point 1 to point 2, however you want to do it, assumes inviscid flow. That, and I go into some of the math, and I kind of skim over the top of the math, can be expressed, and that's a one-dimensional streamline flow. In other words, if I've got flow going this way, then Bernoulli's equation is valid in that streamline. If I get away from, if I want to find out what the streamlines are, I'll do a two-dimensional or three-dimensional analysis, and I'll use, for inviscid flow, I'll use something called Euler's equation. And um, the uh, an Euler's equation is essentially a way of predicting fluid flow in an inviscid fashion. And Euler's equations are not simple, and they're not particularly linear, but they're a fairly close set and they can be solved mm, uh, for, for simple geometries, they're fairly simple to solve. And for complicated geometries, uh, they require uh, like numerical modeling. Okay? But there are lots, if we start put throwing viscosity terms in there, things get ugly. Um, at least oh, uglier than they were with Oilers. 
And then, of course, we have to, the heat transfer effects as well, so we got to deal with that. If we could model all of our um, stuff using Euler's equations, computation fluid dynamics and fluid mechanics for compressible fluids in general would be a lot simpler. Unfortunately, right about the middle of the 18th century, um, many years after Newton came up with this, a Frenchman named jean Ron D'Alembert came up with D'Alembert's paradox. And D'Alembert's paradox basically states that for an object which is symmetric, like for example, a sphere, if I had, you know, it, it's going to have flow around it like this, and this kind of assumes a laminar flow, you know, flow around it like this. If I have flow going around, and I attempt, and if, if an inviscid fluid were to be dream, were to be actually become reality, and was blown basically around this with a free stream velocity u infinity, the net drag on this particular object would be zero. You cannot predict drag using, for this type of object, for any kind of object, using a purely inviscid model. Well, that's, that created a major round pants moment for European science. And it wasn't until the 19th century when we had people like Saint Bernard and Stokes and Navier actually come up with a way of analyzing the Navier Stokes equation. And when they did, except for very simple cases, they could not analyze, uh, estimate the drag. Viscosity is a, if you're going to estimate the drag on an object, in other words, the drag force basically is if, if this thing is held stationary, the FD is what keeps it in place, the drag force. If you're not going to include viscosity, you cannot have a reasonable estimate of the drag force. That simple fact set back, uh, I would say, in that fluid dynamics for about a century. Until, as I said, people like Navier and Stokes and Sam Bernard actually came up with the equations to deal with it, and then they could not do it with the computing power or lack thereof they had at the time. So with that in mind, now, having said all that and having put up a lot of, um, and I, I discussed this in terms of, and of course the other, the other bugaboo in this was turbulence. Laminar flow, by the time we actually could get an estimate of drag, laminar flow where the streamlines are nice and do like this, can be done for simple shapes in some kind of closed form solution. Cylinders, spheres, that sort of thing. However, however, when we get to complex shapes or non-symmetric objects, it gets, and most of all, turbulence. Once the Reynolds number gets high enough, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, um, we have a situation where the, um, we cannot really predict it using analytic solutions. How can we predict it? You're about to find out how it's been done. We're going to actually measure using the using the wind tunnel. Actually, one of the things it does measure is the drag force on objects. One good thing that come out of all of this is that the drag force equation that we use is very similar to Newton's original formulation. It's kind of like it's one of those things where it could have been. We know the area, density, velocity, and if we can measure that drag force, which we will do in the wind tunnel, we can determine coefficient drag. And I have some materials 
on my website, which make it easier for you to do that. So therefore, that's pretty much drag force in a nutshell. And again, I have much more detail on in my monograph on it. Now, before we get into lift, I think we need to take a little trip or what the ancients used to call an excursus and consider uh, the matter of dynamic similarity. And I don't mean to uh, usurp the um, fluid mechanics lecture courses on this subject, but basically the idea is this. If I have a, you know, wind tunnels can only be so large. And I can put small objects, and I can, but and I'm, what I'm really trying to do is simulate large objects. And therefore, be, that being the case, I don't really need to, um, you know, the, really, I, I let me start I want to, I have small objects and I want large objects. I use a concept called dynamic similarity. And dynamic similarity basically states that if I can somehow, by changing the parameters, I can replicate the conditions. Without going into a lot of it, I'm going to present, and that's where these dimensionless numbers come. That's where your Reynolds numbers come in. Um, for example, if I can find out what's important in a system, what's really important in a system, I can d develop a dynamic uh, or dimensionless number and actually use that to size things up. The Reynolds number, for example, which we are pretty much what we use in this one, the, the next experiment we'll talk about the Froude number, is equal to... And this expresses the relationship between the inertia force, the force of, an, of basically the flowing mass past it, and the frictional force. Let's consider a sphere. If I have a small sphere, for example, and, and we're well, going to, you know, Small sphere. Say we're going to start with smooth spheres. Small, smooth sphere. The size of a golf ball, for example. And I run tests on it, and I run them at a certain um, kinematic viscosity, which means a certain density and dynamic viscosity. And I run a velocity past them, and I know the diameter of this thing. And again, that's like the area, there's a lot of convention involved in And so I do that, and I have, and I get inertia, and I, if I do that, let's suppose I want actually a larger, say a basketball size. The diameter is changed. If I can somehow change either the vis velocity or the kinematic viscosity or both, I can have a system which is, uh, which is dynamically similar, and I can estimate the drag on the small sphere, I mean on the large sphere, based on the data we have with the small sphere, provided that the data range on the small sphere is large enough. Now, with the wind tunnel we have, our options are fairly limited. I'll just warn you about that going into this. But in any event, that's the concept behind dynamic similarity. And we have a similar situation with the fruit numbers. And we'll talk about those when we get to um, the hydraulic jump. Okay, with that in mind, that's why Reynolds number is so important. That's why we're going to focus on Reynolds numbers very intensely for this. Okay, lift. lift go A symmetric object will not have lift. However, we, lift is a way we kind of trick objects out 
in order to, let's start with a symmetric airfoil. Let's replace this with a symmetric airfoil. We're going to get the same type of, and I'm going to go straight on you. And it's going to do like this. It's going to be much more aerodynamically. And I say aerodynamic. It's going to, the, the drag coefficient will drop from the sphere. That's not very useful though, because the pressures on, you know, as I said, with Bernoulli's equation, Bernoulli's equation predicts, and we we saw this, uh, we, we we saw this with the um, fluid with with the uh, flow meters. We'll predict that you'll have a velocity, kinetic energy to pressure energy conversion somewhere in here, but the but as long as it's symmetrical, the pressure is going to be the same above and below. Let's consider, for example. If we change the angle at which this thing is, now this is a symmetric one. Let's say U comes from this direction. By the way, the angle between the air float is called and the center line of the cord. By the way, this is the cord of the air float. Remember that because you're going to need it. And what will happen is this fluid will come up and it will react different. It will have a different energy on the top and the bottom. I'm not doing a very good job at representing this. Uh, if you have, I do do a much better job in terms of the pressure distributions in my monograph. But what will basically happen is that the pressures on the low side will be greater than the pressure to the high side, and you'll have a net upward force, the lift force, which is equal to, believe it or not, A rho u squared over 2. The exact same equation is the drag force, only the, um, only the, the only difference being is that the area is different, and that as a result of the lift force. By the way, and I know this is a source of confusion for some. If I've got, and probably, let's suppose I have an airflow that looks like this. That's called the plan form area. That's the area you put into the lift coffee. In fact, you put it into both. You use it for both, for airfoils. This is what I mean by convention. You use the same area for both of them. Both. Okay, that's the plan form area. Now, that being the case, if that's the plan form area, in the case of the airfoil that we run in this wind tunnel, it's more or less rectangular. Well, it was rectangular a long time ago. And I actually have photos of this. And this is the span of the wing. The cross-sectional area is equal to the rectangular is the core times the span for a rectangular. Now, we can put this on a stand. Now, this will be easier to see when we get to the... And we can measure the drag force and the lift force. If we have... Uh, if we measure the force off the stand, we can measure that. And we can determine by solving for these the... Uh, Coefficient drag and coefficient lift. And by the way, I and the same way with symmetric objects, we're just worried about the drag. So we just simply measure the drag force and then we compute the coefficient drag. By the way, I have some helps online to show you how to compute the drag coefficient without getting lost in your units. 
I also have a, an online calculator, which actually came from Stanford originally, that shows you how to compute the um, that shows you how to com to compute your Reynolds numbers and even with varying altitude for standard day, for standard atmosphere. So therefore, there's no reason why you should mess up in this experiment in particular. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever why you should mess up your Reynolds numbers. None. Okay, with that in mind, and I have some examples, actually using the Air Force we have, although at much higher speed. I'll talk about the speed when we get to the lab. But there are a few things that we need to, and, I'll show, and that also shows you kind of how I'm looking for it. There are a couple of things which we need to note about the wind tunnel. One of them, and it's not, we don't really, we just kind of look at the results rather than, is the PF static tube. We talked about the pitot tube when we talked about rotating drum. The pitot static tube is a little is a pitot tube with a little bit higher education, and I actually have a piece on about that about the pitot static tube and how you use it. We use one to measure the velocity of the wind tunnel, and we actually put it upstream from the object we're testing, so that we don't have the object we're testing affect the free stream velocity that we're measuring. Okay, another one. There are a couple of things I want to mention about pitfalls of wind tunnel testing. And in the reduction of your data, you're going to run into these. There are two in particular. One is tear, and the other is interference. In our wind tunnel, we have a fairly, at least relative to the airfoil, substantial ride. And that rod transmits these forces down to the, the wind tunnel where they can, it will measure them and return those data to us. The stand itself has drag. And as a result, if your object is not large, particularly the, the smaller your object here, whether it be an airfoil or sphere or something in between, the more significant this becomes. That is referred to as the tear. Getting that out of your wind tunnel calculations is kind of is an important thing, but it's kind of beyond this experiment the way that it's been constructed. The other thing with lift is not as much problem. And in fact, I will mention to you that the lift values of this particular um, that lift in general is easier to compute using CFD and easier to make more, more accurately measure wind tunnel. Both in both cases. Drag, your viscous effects really control lift, not necessarily. You can actually do pretty good estimates of lift without a viscous solver. Drag, not so much. Okay, the other one is the interference. Our wind tunnel is about, oh, that in diameter. If you were to put a very large object into there, what, you know, the idea behind a wind tunnel is to simulate free stream, in other words, U infinity. And U infinity, if you put too large of an object in the wind tunnel, then what will happen is the actual velocities going around the object are much greater than the free stream velocity that the wind tunnel is pulling through and your pitot tube, stack tube, is measuring. That is referred to as interference. We have to kind of restrict the um, size of our objects in, in any wind tunnel. Our wind tunnel is small, we have small objects. Large wind tunnel, we have to. And uh, as a result, interference is something we have to watch for. And balance, as you can probably figure it out already, Balancing the two, particularly with a small wind tunnel like ours, is one, it's one of the really key, tricky parts, so to speak, of wind tunnel testing. So at this point, we've gone through the basics of wind tunnel testing. We've gone a little longer than usual. Let's go to the lab and take a look at the wind tunnel 
and run some tests. This is the wind tunnel we'll be using. It's an open wind tunnel. The end you're looking at is the intake end where it, take, where it brings the air in from just simply the outside. It's not pressurized in any way. Once it gets in, we measure the velocity using this pedostatic tube, which I'm focusing on right here. Whatever we're testing is mounted in the stand. Uh, that's an airfall. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And it's mounted in that stand, and below it is the, is, are two things. At the very bottom is the mechanism used to measure the force of lift and the force of drag. The force of lift being, of course, the vertical force, and the force of drag being the horizontal force. You'll also notice that there's a little indicator here. I'm kind of going, coming at it backwards, but that's the angle of attack indicator. You can actually adjust the angle of attack. Currently, the angle of attack is set at zero. And then you have the control system for the wind tunnel. It's fairly old. And the power supply for that control system. And we have in the back here the exhaust. Actually, the fan pulls air through the wind tunnel and then it exhausts out this way. So you don't want to be standing here during the operation of the tunnel. Over here is the, is the computer. We do have a computerized control for this wind tunnel, but that's about it. Here in the front, and you're going to be seeing a lot of this in just a few minutes, is the lift and drag. The airspeed doesn't really work anymore. Um, lift and drag. Those are the lift and pounds and the drag and pounds that are being exerted on the stand. So that, in a nutshell, is the wind tunnel. And we mount the object securely on the stand. The object that is currently in the stand is, and the one we're going to start with first, is a NACA 0012 airfoil. And I'll give the dimensions of that airfoil elsewhere. And you can determine the area and all in that. And of course the diameter, the quote unquote diameter to be more accurate. Uh, this airfoil is a fairly, probably the most analyzed airfoil shape in existence. It's very common to analyze this in CFD. My monograph wind tunnel testing has some extensive data on the subject. What we're going to do with this is the following. We're going to, with an airfoil like this, the way we do it is we take and we pick a couple of speeds, and I'll tell you what those speeds are when we get up to them. And what we're going to do is we're going to vary that angle of attack, which you see is currently set at zero, and we're going to vary it one direction. Because it's a symmetric airfoil, we don't really need and wouldn't get a lot out of varying it in two directions. Once we do that, then we can, um, from there, we'll take and break down the data. And we'll analyze the lift and the drag for a, for a, variety, of, for a variety of angles of attack for two different airspeeds. Now, one thing you want to be looking for in this is the stall. Eventually, what will happen is, is that the lift coefficient will start dropping at a certain angle of attack. That angle of attack it reaches maximum is referred to as the stall angle. And once it reaches this, uh, it's a very dangerous situation in flight to reach the stall angle because basically what usually happens is that the airplane starts dropping and dropping very rapidly when it stalls. So therefore, you need to be, uh, you need to be watching for that as you analyze the data we're going to get out of this wind tunnel. All right, now I've turned the air on you can see the little streamers on the back of the airfoil vibrating that's because of the air. My current airspeed is about 25.7 miles an hour. Now because of the way that you probably notice I had to look over this panel in order to uh, get to the angle of attack and Basically, 
because what is the most important thing for you to do is to properly read the gauges, what I'm going to do is I'm going to announce the airspeed. I've already done that. I'm going to announce the angle of attack, and you can take the data as I actually gather. So let me come, let me go ahead and work on the first one. And currently we are at zero angle of attack. Okay, now we're at two degrees angle of attack. Let me see if I can get a little bit easier way to do this. Okay, now we're at four degrees angle of attack. Now we're at six degrees angle of attack. You can actually see the airfoil angling upward, which is what it's supposed to do. The angle of attack, of course, is the angle between the airstream, which is essentially horizontal, and the, and the airfoil, which right at the moment isn't. We're at eight degrees angle of attack now. And 10 degrees angle of attack. I'm at 12 degrees angle of attack. Fourteen degrees angle of attack. You see already that the uh, streamers are beginning to react. You're starting to probably see some evidence of stall. And let me just go to 16. And this is 16 degrees angle of attack. Now what I'm going to do to save a little time, and I actually do this in the lab, is increase the airspeed to about 45 miles an hour. Stick around to the end to the end. 
we'll have a little story about that. Now we're going to check the drag of a sphere. The sphere is loaded in the wind tunnel. As you can see, the drag is set to zero for zero um, miles an hour. What I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the speed up to about 50 miles an hour. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to tell you what the airspeed is. And you can see the drag speed for yourself on the gauge below. So let's go ahead and get started with this. First air speed is 18.8 miles an hour. This air speed is 25.6 miles an hour. because they, they, you dial in one airspeed and you end up getting another one. The last object we're going to test is this streamlined sphere. The diameter for it will be given for you either in the uh, description of YouTube, the comments in my website, or wherever, but you'll find it. In any event, it is, again, the, stream, the diameter being the diameter at the largest um, the largest diameter of it. Basically, it's a sphere, but it's been streamlined. And the purpose of testing this is for you to compare it with the other sphere. Now, the only way you can, the two are not the same diameter. The only way you can compare the two and come up with a reasonable result is use dynamic similarity, i.e., what you'll need to do is to plot them on the same graph 
with rounds numbers versus dry coefficient and compare it to and see the effect of the streamlining. So let's go ahead and get the collected data. The first air speed is 18.9 miles an hour. The second air speed is 25.9 miles an hour. Speed is 32.4 miles an hour. And that's the data for that shape. I promised a story about why, you know, this 50 mile an hour wind tunnel isn't as irrelevant as you think, at least not for me. It goes back to the 1930s. And my grandfather, Chet Warrington, was a fairly prominent figure in Washington, D.C. aviation during the 1930s. He was the first president of the Washington Air Derby Association and organized the first um, Washington Air Derby at what is now at Washington Hoover Airport, which is where the Pentagon is now in 1932. That location was kind of a dud, so he moved it to College Park and over in Maryland. And in 1933, in May 1933, he had the first of what they call the Langley Day events. This is back during the barnstorming era, very much the golden age of aviation in many ways. And he was very much enamored with an engine called the OX-5, which Curtis had developed right around World War I. It was, it was not a very fast engine, and it was not a very, not always reliable engine, but it's one that really kind of had a lot of romance to it. And when you hook up to a big propeller, it was very efficient, if not very fast. So Chet, organized, two of the races he organized were as follows. The first one was a slow race. And a slow race basically means that you basically have to run the aircraft as slow as possible in order to get from, you know, in other words, the person that lost the race basically won the race from one point to another. And the other was a race of OX-5 engines. Well, um, Jeff thought that was a great idea. And he put it in, he had people enter the competition and right before the air meet, the National Aeronautic Association decided that it was not safe. And they told Chet to cancel the, uh, cancel the, those two events in, the, in Langley Day. Leave the rest of them. Chet wouldn't have anything of it. He called his peop these people swivel chair broomstick pilots and just absolutely told them this 
then it's going ahead with or without your sanction. In other words, you're, we're going to do this whether you like it or not. He went through with it. They didn't like it, but that was the end of it. And But those planes, generally speaking, I think those races, the speeds were just about 50 to 55 miles an hour. So I guess you're, this wind tunnel you've been looking at is kind of the OX-5 of wind tunnels. So in any event, again, thanks for watching and God bless.